morning, church. My name is Mahadi. I'm from a Norweg Life Group. Uh, today's Bible reading is from 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to surface. And then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to me than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. Though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect, no. I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what we believe. This is the word of the Lord. It's quite an old song. Um, if you're joining us for the very first time, you are thinking to yourself, what in the world uh, did I just watch? Um, we have been working our way uh, as a church through a series titled Anthems of the Age. Uh, and we've been looking at some popular songs um, across the ages and just investigating the message that they bring. Uh, one of the things that we believe is that songs are a window into our culture, a window into some of our deepest longings and our deepest desires, our deepest fears and our deepest hopes. Uh, so as we engage with the song, I hope that you will have it with you uh, to read through the lyrics and somehow figure out what Peggy Lee uh, was trying to convey in, in that song. Um, and the key thing why we would want to do that is because we believe uh, that Jesus meets us in our deepest longings uh, and our deepest uh, desires, uh, and he has a message for us. Uh, so we're just having a Jesus conversation, uh, as Black said last week. Uh, so I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray that God will help us as we get into this, uh, his word. Uh, please bow your heads as I do pray for us. Father, we thank you for a morning like this. We thank you for the glory, the beauty uh, of your story. Uh, we thank you that throughout history, you have been working with people, uh, that this morning you have an appointment with somebody uh, who, who came in, uh, Father, searching with deep longings, and I do pray that um, if they resonate with the song, uh, that you speak life into them. I pray that you would help us as we engage with your word uh, to see the hope of the Christian story. Uh, this we pray in Jesus' name and for our good. Amen. And now as I chose this song, I chose it specifically for baby boomers. Um, if you don't know what baby boomers are, those are the people who were born after the World War um, from 1946 or so up until 1964, and the likes of some of you here this morning. Um, we looked at One Republic, Kanye West, uh, so I thought I should have a song uh, for our baby boomers. Uh, the 8 o'clock people were live, alive as they, they uh, uh, listened to, uh, to this song. Um, some, some of them didn't know who Peggy Lee was. Uh, maybe you don't know who Peggy Lee was, uh, but you know the song Fever, right? Uh, maybe you sang it to your girlfriend, You Give Me Fever. Um, it, is, um, it is one of her more famous ones, uh, if you didn't know. Uh, that is uh, Peggy Lee who sang that song. Uh, one person in staff this week asked me how I came across this song. Well, it was through Black Eyed Peas. Uh, they sampled a section of the song, Is That All There Is? And then I went on to Google the, uh, the song, and then I discovered uh, Peggy Lee. Um, and what I like about this song, what I like about the baby boomers, is that they have experience in life. 
You know, there's those people that you speak to and you can tell that, man, this person has lived. And so this song has that. Um, this song, I must warn you, is slightly grim, uh, so it's quite um, doom and gloom, but there is hope in the end, right? Uh, so as we go on through it, uh, you'll feel uh, the weight of it uh, because it is the life experience of someone uh, who has seen it all and who sings um, about it. I love the lyrics, that they're clear uh, and they give us a picture into our culture and some of the things uh, that we long for. Now, if you're sitting up there, if you want to kind of know more what, about who Peggy Lee is, just think of uh, Taylor Swift uh, in the 1950s. Co combine that image with Zora Abantu, if you know who that is. Uh, quite a controversial figure. Uh, so this was the Taylor Swift of your grandmother and grandfather's generation. Um, she was quite big. She's the first female to reach the top 10 list of the greatest hits for three decades. Uh, so over 30 years, her music remained relevant. And this particular song that we sing, even though it's not the most popular song, it is one that, of all 13 Grammy nominations, that won her the Grammy in 1969. So this is definitely an anthem of, of the age. It won her the Grammy as best female vocalist uh, back in, in those days. Uh, so it's an anthem of our age and it has a light and shines a light into some of the things that we feel uh, and experience in this, in this life. Now before we get into the song, uh, we want to explore the life of Peggy Lee uh, because it's quite important to us uh, to understand uh, her life because it sheds light into the lyrics that she, uh, that she uh, sings. Uh, this song was not specifically written by her, uh, but she performs it, and in many ways it resembles in her own ways her life, uh, her life that was filled with pain, disappointments, uh, her life uh, that... Um, was filled with uh, despair. Um, Peggy Lee was born in the States, uh, and at about the age of four, she lost her mom. Um, and that's a tragic and traumatic experience. And then she had to live with her father, who used alcohol as a coping mechanism as she grew uh, up and saw uh, her father on and on uh, drinking himself to, uh, to death, uh, which that is traumatic in of itself. At, the, at around the age of six, uh, she, her house, the house that she stayed in, and she sings about it, burned down. Uh, and if you've ever experienced something like that, it's such a tragic loss uh, that she had to, uh, to experience. Not only that, but if you think life can get bad, uh, then uh, you'd have never met Peggy Lee. Um, she later on got a stepmother who was very abusive, um, one occasion, on one occasion, she retells the story of her mother working here. I don't know if you've ever seen those steel skillet pens, those heavy ones. Uh, she knocked her on the head uh, with that. And what is sad is that as she reflects on that story, uh, she blames herself. Uh, she says, well, uh, it's probably because I, um, I deserved it at that stage. Uh, and if you think the story cannot get any worse, then later on in life, uh, Peggy Lee goes on to search for love, and she goes on to search for companionship. Uh, we know from her story that she had four failed marriages, uh, and the third one was the worst. Uh, the third one marked the pain of her life. It was emotionally and physically abusive. abusive. Uh, and what is said is that, like many cases of abuse, uh, she stayed in that marriage, uh, hoping uh, that the guy would change. Um, on one occasion, she said that on her wedding day, instead of wearing a veil, she should have worn a crash helmet uh, because this man, uh, this would mark the start of her life of a marriage that was filled with um, abuse. Pain, disappointment, as you read through this, um, this, this song, uh, not only disappointment, but a feeling of despair and hopelessness um, that, you, that you see. Uh, this is what she had to say, and this is why it's key for us to understand the background of her story, because this is what she says about this song. Before it was released, she said that this is my song, this is the story 
of my life. Um, and as we go through it, I wonder how many of us would say that this is my song. Uh, this is a song that would mark my life. I've experienced these things and I've been left with pain and disappointment. Perhaps you coming in here, uh, you've had hope, you started your life uh, hopeful, uh, maybe you are in your 40s and you realize that your dreams have died, your dreams to build a legacy for yourself, uh, your dreams to start a business, uh, those are, that is the one thing that uh, people don't speak about at a family bri. Uh, because they know your, your failure. You know it more than they know it, and life has dealt you um, a great deal of harm. Uh, it hasn't dealt you great cards. Perhaps that's not you. Maybe you are in your 40s, 50s, and you've worked hard. Uh, you've worked hard, and your life is going well. Uh, your life has gone well. you got all the money that you need. You can go on holidays. Uh, it is great. Um, you have the money. Uh, but the relationships uh, at home are wacky and they are out of balance because your kids, all they wanted was uh, dad to be at home, but they never experienced that. And you look at your life and you say, well, I have this money, uh, but I cannot enjoy it. I cannot enjoy it with my kids. Not only that, but you are constantly reminded because you live in a country where you are reminded that because of your success, you are part of the top 1% in the country and you feel the guilt and the weight of it. You just seem like you cannot enjoy your money. You've dedicated yourself to giving that money, uh, but people will abuse you, they use you, and you just lost all hope and you're wondering to yourself, is this all there is? Maybe you came in here, you've had hopes from a young age uh, of that beautiful marriage and, and that marriage you hoped for did not turn out the way that you had hoped for. Uh, perhaps that's your life. Maybe you are a teenager and all you've ever experienced was a life of hypocrisy uh, from your family. Uh, perhaps on Instagram, uh, the pictures look nice. Um, the, your family looks put together. It looks like you guys are tight. But in actual fact, it is all just a facade. Uh, it is, there's a lot going on underneath and you've suffered with loneliness and a feelings of exclusion, and all you've ever known was hopelessness, all you've ever known was hypocrisy. And I wonder, like Peggy, Peggy Lee, if you've ever asked yourself the question, is that all there is to this life? Uh, surely there's gotta be more to life. Uh, surely there's a time when my pain ends. Can, can life just give me a break? Um, surely you feel in this sense of paralysis and hopelessness as you reflect on life, whether it's been good to you, uh, whether it's been bad. Uh, whatever the case may be, uh, many of us um, can feel the words that Peggy Lee sings. Is that all there is? Is that all there is um, to this life? Obviously, that phrasing of itself, it's both a question and an answer, right? It's a question. Is that all there is? But it's also just a deep sense of Hope that this is not all there is, uh, that, that there's something more um, to this world, to this life, than what we see and touch. And so, with that said, we're going to get into our song, and I hope that we would see the brokenness of the song, the longings of the song, uh, and the hope of the gospel message as we later on hear from God's word. So I hope you have it. Um, just to... This is going to feel like English class. I know you hated English class, um, but they will talk about stanzas. Uh, we have uh, four stanzas there. Uh, we have uh, uh, four choruses there. Uh, and then the, f the first stanza kind of speaks of, uh, Peggy Lee speaks of uh, the gloomy picture of loss uh, when uh, she experienced the fire. The second one is um, she's talking about feelings of joy. Uh, so an experience of joy as she went on to see this greatest show on earth. Then, then the, f the third one is the feeling of falling in love. I don't know how many of you have ever fallen in love. Um, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Um, remember that uh, time in matric or grade 11 when you fell in love with a girl. When you asked her out in grade 11... Uh, and she said, yes, there are feelings of excitement. And then later on, 
uh, the feelings of sorrow when she dumped you in uh, grade 12. Um, you don't have to say amen if you remember, <laughs> if you remember those. Uh, you can come chat to me after the service. The third one, she speaks of that experience, and then the last one, which is the more grim one, as she uh, um, realizes that even death itself is a disappointment. As she thinks and contemplates of taking her own life, uh, she realizes that, man, even that is a final uh, disappointment. So four stanzas and a repeated chorus there, is that all there is, my friends? If that's all there is, let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball, if that's all there is. Let's have a look at the first stanza there. Uh, as she uh, experiences trauma in her early years as a little girl. She says, I remember when I was a little girl, our, fire caught, our house caught on fire. I'll never forget the look in my father's face as he gathered me up in his arms and raced through the building, to, through the burning building, out on the pavement. And I stood there shivering in my pajamas and watched the whole world go up in flames. And when it was all over, I said to myself, is that all there is to the fire? Such a traumatic experience of loss, um, if you've ever gone through it. I, I still remember as a young kid, one of our houses burned down, and that image is still entrenched in my, in my brain. It is a moment of trauma that you can never forget. Um, yet, as you listen to uh, these lyrics, it seems that Peggy brushes off that feeling of trauma with this word. Is that all there is to the fire? She brushes it off uh, as if it doesn't impact her in that way. Um, the second stanza there, and when I was 12 years old, my dad took me to the circus, the greatest show on earth. There were clowns and elephants and dancing bears, and a beautiful lady in pink tights flew high above our heads, and I said, and as I sat there watching, I had the feeling that something was missing. I don't know what, but when it was all over, I said to, the, to myself, is that all there is to the circus? Um, Peggy Lee comes to realize that her life wasn't just filled with sad moments, and life isn't just filled with sad moments. Life is filled with happy moments, isn't it? Um, celebrations with family. Um, life is filled with uh, great holidays, but she comes to this show, the greatest show as she describes it, and at the end of it, she realizes that even that comes to an end. And because it does, what is the point of it? Is that all there is to the circus? Surely there's got to be more to life than this fleeting moment uh, of fun. She goes on to say in the third stanza, um, and then I fell in love with the most wonderful boy in the world, would take long walks by the river, or just sit for hours gazing into each other's eyes. How many of you, of you have been there? We were so very much in love, then one day he went away, and I thought I'd die, but I didn't. And when I didn't, I said to myself, is that all there is to love? Is that all there is? Is that all uh, there is? Um, to this life, the happy moments, the disappointments and the sad moments, the fleeting moments, the moments that start off as happy, like falling in love, and then it uh, goes, comes crashing down. Is that all there is, my friends? If that's all there is, then let's keep dancing, let's break out the booze and have a ball, if that's all there is, if that's all there is. Uh, now, the reason why I was drawn to this song is because it echoes the words of another guy uh, who came long, long before Peggy Lee, uh, a Jewish rabbi by the name of Paul. Uh, Paul experienced life in an affluent city uh, of Corinth. He went there on a church planting mission, um, and then he, he started a church there. Uh, he experienced uh, life in this city that was in many ways, the epitome of um, just Roman opulence, the epitome of Roman civilization, uh, the city uh, of Corinth. 
And as he engages with uh, these people that he's, that he's writing to the Corinthians, he comes to this conclusion about life. Uh, and he says to them, if this life is all there is, echoing the words of Peggy Lee, then Paul says in, Rome, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Uh, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Let us have a ball. Let us have a jaw because this life is all there is. Um, when you take this kind of thinking to its logical conclusion, you are left with nothing because there's nothing in this world. And because you're left with nothing, you need to fill your life with something that is going to give you a sense of meaning and purpose, a sense of peace and satisfaction. If that's all there is, then let us have fun. That was the, the message uh, of uh, Paul to the Corinthian, the Corinthian church. And the more I've engaged with the church in Corinth, the more I see similarities with our own culture of Joburg, South Africa. It's as if they're distant cousins, cousins uh, because the same things that were happening in Corinth are the same things that happen uh, right here in Johannesburg in Midrand, uh, that we live for the moment. We live uh, for the moment because very often, uh, we think that this life is all there is. And if this life is all there is, then let us do that. Let us have the best booze out there. Um, let us have the best whiskey out there. I don't know what is the best whiskey. I hear it's Johnny Walker, uh, the blue label one. Uh, again, you don't have to say amen because you're gonna um, out yourself there. Uh, Johnny Walker, um, that is smooth, uh, that's matured over years, single, uh, more, single origin, whatever that means. Um, it's, uh, it's been put in a cast for many years and it has a smooth taste, then let us do that. Let us go if we can afford that uh, because of our economic situation. Let's do that. Um, if you can't afford that, uh, you can afford coffee, surely. Uh, you can afford coffee here by Carswald. Go there and uh, take Jägermaster shorts, um, as many as your corporate SA salary can afford. Uh, because this life is all there is. If this life is all there is, then go to Santin, go to that uh, hotel, uh, that wonderful restaurant called the Maslow, and go have um, caviar, go eat lobsters and have a bowl, and stuff your face with the best food ever. Go to see the greatest show on earth, the Trevor Noah show later on in the year, um, <laughs> and laugh, laugh it off, uh, because this is all there is. Uh, because in any case, you will die. We all will. Um, so if that's all there is, then let's have a ball. That's what uh, Paul says to this church in Corinth. He's echoing the, the philosophy of his own time, uh, the philosophy of the Romans. Uh, they said, they coined a phrase uh, called moment, momento mori. Remember death, carpe diem. Uh, seize the moment. Suck the marrow out of life because this life is all there is. Uh, and because you only have this one opportunity, uh, let's break down the booze. Let's have a ball if that's all uh, there is. And that is what the city of Corinth experienced. Um, people who had it all, who chased experience, moving from one party to another, uh, just so as to feel uh, their life, just so as to feel that emptiness and that void of feeling hopeless uh, that this life is all there is. Uh, they tend to money, to sex, to power, just to numb themselves from the reality of living life uh, outside of God's domain, a life uh, where this world is all there is. They had a ball. Uh, they lived the philosophy of the day uh, that Gen Z is called YOLO. You only live once. Um, and th behind that philosophy is that have a ball, enjoy your life now because you only live once. Or as the philosopher uh, of South Africa, Mdu Masilela, Professor Dr. Mdu Masilela once said, Opila um, Haiwan, you only live once and because of that, let's have a ball. It is the South African experience, it is the Corinthian experience, it's the Roman experience, and it was Peggy Lee's uh, experience. If this life is all there is, then let us have a ball. And I think many of us here this morning, Joe Beggars, we know this thing. We have this feeling that one day life will end. Um, we have this feeling and understanding. We're in tune with the realities of life. 
that it doesn't always pan out the way we want, that it's filled with disappointment, pain, uh, and very often we despair at that. Uh, we know that it's filled with good moments and we chase those good moments because they give us a sense of just momentary pleasure and hope. Uh, so we know all of those, um, those things. Um, we know the reality of life. And basically what we do is that we don't want to phase up to the bad stuff. Uh, we want to live in the happy moments. We want to move from moment to moment. We numb ourselves with so many things, with busyness, uh, just so as we can cope with that reality of our mortality. And that is who, uh, who we are. We numb ourselves from the pain. And I think as I, I'm still young, right? <laughs> but I've lived life and I've just watched over the years um, especially growing up in a village, uh, seeing men, grown men, numbing them, their lives, numbing their lives by going to a tavern. Um, after, they, after work, they would not go straight home. After work, they would go to their home, which was the tavern. Uh, and at the tavern, they found solace. At the tavern, they found hope uh, as they drank Zamalek. Uh, they were looking for hope at the bottom of that bottle, uh, and that's the reality uh, that I grew in, grew up in. And I think many a times as a young man, as I looked at that, uh, I used to judge those men quite a lot. I used to think to myself, what a bunch of losers uh, gathering up at a tavern with no purpose, uh, with no vision in life. I'm going to be different when I grow up. Um, that's the arrogance of youth, isn't it? Um, that we look at those men and we don't understand the things that they are running away from. Uh, we don't understand the reason why they go to the tavern. But the other thing that I later figured out as I grow older is that all of us have a tavern that we go to. All of us have a tavern that we go to. Yes, somebody's tavern might have sticky floors and loud music, uh, but your tavern might have air condition, air conditioner. Um, it might have coffee just to give you that kick, um, just to give you that push. Uh, you move from project to project, uh, from promotion to promotion, from title to title, um, and it looks like progress, right? <laughs> it looks like you're going somewhere, but very often we use busyness to numb ourselves from the reality of what we will all face, to numb ourselves from the pain that we experience. Some of us run to hard work. Uh, some people's taverns have uh, pool tables and screens that play replays of old uh, English Premier League games with Arsenal dominating. Um, some people's taverns have that. Uh, but perhaps your tavern is something different. Uh, perhaps your tavern is the Tinder hookups. Uh, perhaps your tavern is that office affair. Uh, perhaps your tavern is working so hard um, to make a difference in this world. Many of us find ourselves like that, right? We work so hard to try to improve other people's lives, and that's a good thing. Many of those things are good things, but we run to them as a way to numb ourselves from the pain that we experience uh, in life. Uh, we all want to tranquilize ourselves from these things uh, that Peggy Lee speaks of. Uh, we all want to eat and drink because in any case, tomorrow we die. Let us have fun because that's going to make us and give us a sense uh, of purpose uh, and meaning. Now you might be sitting here and thinking, geez, this guy, <laughs> he's very negative, isn't he? Um, and I am actually uh, an optimist in life, uh, but because of Jesus and the hope that we have in the scriptures, we can get a sense of hope and meaning in this broken, broken world. And I'm not here to just bash us and to tell us about um, our hopelessness, uh, but the reason why we're looking at this song is because we want to see a sense of hope. The reason why Paul says to the Corinthians, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die, is because he wants them uh, to realize that indeed there is more to life than all they experience. There's more to life for you than your stressful job in corporate SA. There's more to life for you than your failures and your fears. Uh, there's more to life than your fleeting fun moments. There's more to life 
than your saddest moments, your brokenness, uh, than your pain and disappointments. And that is what Paul would want us to remember as he points us to see that after all is said and done, there is a Lord who rose again from the grave, and that Lord has attained something for us that we didn't even know that we are longing for and hoping for. As he engages with the Corinthian church, he points them to the resurrected Jesus. Uh, and the resurrected Jesus, according to Paul, is the hope of the world. Because the resurrected Jesus reminds us that there is more to this life uh, than what we see and what we touch. And the very thing that we long him for, uh, that sense of meaning, can be attained through him and through him alone. Uh, if you can, please turn to the other side of your page. As you hear this words, this story, and as Paul reminds these Christians of the Christian story, uh, the Christian story is about a Lord who died for the sins of people, who was in a physical do tomb, which means that he was dead, and he remained dead for a few days. He came back to life, uh, and not only that, he ascended and he appeared to many people, and there's a lot of evidence uh, for his resurrection. And the biggest evidence for his resurrection is actually the life of Paul, who himself was transformed by meeting this Jesus. Uh, this Jesus who can also transform your life. Have a look at verse 3. As Paul recounts this Christian story, he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And he appeared, he gives evidence of this resurrection, and he appeared to Cephas, there is a man called Peter, the same Peter who ran on the night that Jesus was crucified, it would be the same Peter who goes on to say that Jesus is risen, the same Peter would be crucified and stood his ground in saying that Jesus is alive. Verse 6, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers, that's a lot of people, at one time. So this is not just a made-up story. Whom are still alive, you can go ask them. Then he appeared to the apostles. Last of all, he appeared to me, Paul says. And Paul experienced the grace of meeting this Lord Jesus Christ. This is the message of hope that Paul brings to the Corinthians. And this is the message of hope that Paul brings to us this morning, a message of a risen, a risen Lord. And as I thought of it, as I read through 1 Corinthians and some of the thinking around Corinth, uh, some of the things that they were longing for, and the story of Peggy Lee, and this deep sense in which she lived a lonely life, uh, that she used to run to fill her life, with sex, at some point she was addicted to drugs, at some point she was boozing it off every single day of uh, her life, at some point she contemplated taking her life. Have a look at the last verse there uh, of her, uh, um, her song. She says, I know what you must be saying to yourself. If that's the way she feels about it, why doesn't she just end it all? Oh no, not me. I'm not ready for that final disappointment because I know just as well as I am standing here talking to you that when that final moment comes and I'm breathing my last breath, I'll be saying to myself, is that all there is? As I thought about this story, I'm like, it's so multi-layered, right? On the one sense, she's searching for meaning. On the other, she's numbing her pain. The next is searching for deep relationships. I wanted a single word that would capture this thing that Peggy was longing for. And there's no English word that captures this, and luckily we have other languages um, to shed a light on this. A single word that captures all of these things that Peggy was longing for, that our hearts often long for, is the word shalom, a word that means peace a word that means perfect peace, a peace between us and God, a peace between us and our neighbor, 
uh, that this relationship between us and God changes the way we relate to other people, which is what Peggy was longing for. It changes the way we relate to our world, which was pe- what Peggy was longing for. It is a deep sense of wholeness and completeness, a deep sense of satisfaction and meaning. And what Paul says is that that deep shalom, that deep sense of perfect peace, as the Soto people call it, Khoto. Um, as someone, if someone greets you and say Khoto, uh, they say Khoto Ebeluena, peace be with you, that may God look favorably upon you, may he change you and give you a good life, and may he make the rains pour down and water your land so that you can have food. Um, it is a picture of perfect peace, a picture where everything is just right. Uh, This is what we long for. And what Paul says to this Corinthians is that what God did in the Lord Jesus Christ achieves for us this perfect peace. What God did for us on that cross reconciled us and our relationship uh, between the holy God and us, the imperfect people. It brought together that relationship. Not only that, but when Jesus went to the pits, he did so, so that you and I can come out of our pits, out of our pain, out of our disappointment. Not only was he in a tomb, but he was resurrected again, proving to us and putting a stem to us of this sure thing, uh, that no matter what life throws our way, uh, no matter what may happen with us, there is this sure thing that sin and brokenness will not have the last say. Sin and brokenness will not have the last say in your life because of what Jesus has done. Jesus has come to bring us a perfect peace, a perfect peace. And because of that, we can come to realize that, yes, this life is not all there is. There is more to it. The resurrection of Jesus proves it, and the resurrection of Jesus gives it to us because in that, in what God has done, he gave us more. He gave us himself um, because in himself we found perfect peace because perfect peace is the presence of a person and that person is God. Uh, And God came in the Lord Jesus uh, to restore us back uh, to himself, uh, to give us a taste of what it means uh, to live and taste Uh, this peace. And I wonder if you came in here this morning, perhaps this describes your life. I wonder if you've come to taste this perfect peace. I wonder if you've reconciled to your maker, because there and only there will be your deepest longing, will be the place where your deepest longings are met. God invites you this morning. God invites you wherever you came in, Um, to do that. Uh, So why don't we bow our heads as I lead us in a time of prayer and as you reflect on your life and as you come to the realization that only God can give you this perfect, perfect peace. Let's pray this prayer in your heart. I'm going to lead us in this prayer. Uh, This prayer, I'm going to say it and then we'll pray together. It says, Dear God, I'm tired of living my life in my own terms. I want to confess that I've lived my life as my own king, that I've lived as if this is all there is, not acknowledging that Jesus is the risen king. I now know that he died for my sins. I now know that he was raised to life. I now know that him and only him can give me perfect peace. Please give me power to turn away from my sin. Please help me find hope in him. Please help me find peace in him. Please make me a Christian this day. Well, if that's a prayer that you resonate with, I'm going to once again lead us in that. Dear God, um, Tired. I'm tired of living life on my own terms. I want to confess that I've lived as my own king, that I've lived as if this life is all there is. Not acknowledging that Jesus is the risen king, 
I now know that he died for my sins. I know that he was raised to life. I know that he can give me perfect peace. Please give me the power this morning to turn away from my sins. Please give me a, the power to embrace him as Lord over my life. Please make me a Christian. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name and for our good. Amen.